So today I'm going to be talking about the Tesla Cybertruck, which has been a very polarizing vehicle. Generally, EVs are polarizing, Tesla's polarizing, and the appearance of the Cybertruck has been extremely polarizing. Jason Camisa did an excellent video for Haggerty's Icon series on YouTube on the Cybertruck, and I highly recommend you watch that. I will start off by saying I'm excited. Aside from the usual Tesla innovations that the Cybertruck will have, like the large castings front and rear, the 4680 battery cells, and their self-driving technology, it's also bringing to the table some genuine innovation and risk-taking and it's receiving a lot of criticism for doing that. And first off, we've got to talk about the styling. Now, clearly the design is polarizing. I'm not trying to argue that it's not, but I think a lot of people are missing the fact that form really is following function here. And with that, I'm referring to the exoskeleton. The styling has been largely dictated by the fact that this high strength steel they're using on the exterior for the exoskeleton, uh, they're not able to form into what you'd normally see in stampings for other modern vehicles that have much more complex designs and curves. They're able to make straight bends in it, but obviously doing that alone is going to limit the ability to style it. There's still changes that they could have made. They could have designed it to be slightly different while still working within the limitations of the material. But at the end of the day, the reason that it looks generally the way it does is because of the material they used and the utility that that material offers. So if you're going to levy criticism about the looks, I think that you have to at least acknowledge that there's a reason that it looks that way. And that in this case, form follows function, which should be the case for a utility vehicle like the Cybertruck, in my opinion, at least. And the Cybertruck, while I think it does have some awkward angles, overall, I think it is actually a pretty cool design. So since we've already talked about it, let me start with the exoskeleton. From what I've heard, it seems like a lot of people are questioning why do I need an exoskeleton? Why does it have to be bulletproof, etc.? And from my perspective, why wouldn't you want that, right? This is a utility vehicle, this is a truck. As long as there's not some major trade-off as far as cost or weight, which there doesn't seem to be in this case, I would absolutely rather have the most durable exterior exoskeleton that I could. Trucks are supposed to be utilitarian and tough. You're using them for things like driving off-road, and doing construction projects or other utility uses. And in the course of those things, there's going to be times when a normal truck body would incur damage if you're really using it for what it was designed to do. And then when that happens, you have two options. You can either spend a bunch of money to constantly fix the vehicle. Your other option is to just let the damage happen, let the damage accumulate and have your vehicle look like junk and basically slowly deteriorate over time. It's just a huge benefit to not have to worry about dinging up the truck, about scratches and paint chipping off and rust, and all the things that go along with every other vehicle on the market. I really like to use my vehicles for what they were made for. I think sometimes people have a tendency, myself included, to get something really nice that was made to perform this awesome task, but then be apprehensive about using it for that task because of how much money they spent or because they're afraid of wearing it out. And how great would it be to be able to use a vehicle for what it's designed for and not have to worry about it incurring excessive wear and tear. For example, I had a 1995 Pathfinder that I used to take off-road and during the course of off-roading, it incurred damage and I broke mirrors multiple times, I broke the antenna, I broke a tail light, and a lot of brush marks on the side. And that was a trade-off that I was willing to make to use it for what it was intended for. But at the end of the day, I still wanted my vehicle to look nice. So as these things happened, I would try and mitigate it by replacing the parts that had broken and trying to keep it as clean as I could. But I would love to have a vehicle where it's durable enough that I can use it for what it's made for and not have to worry about constantly repairing it or having it deteriorate and kind of look like crap. In the same vein, with the Mazda CX-50 that we have for my wife, you know, we go out and buy a brand new vehicle, and then unfortunately, you just have to accept that you're going to park it in parking lots, and strangers are going to ding your car, or they're going to hit their cart into it, and that's just a fact of life. To me, it's kind of crazy that everyone's just accepted that these brand new vehicles that we spend tens of thousands of dollars on are just inevitably going to get damaged by random strangers, but I would love to have a vehicle where that wasn't just a fact of life. And unless somebody's trying really, really hard to damage your vehicle, they're not going to damage it just through carelessness. 
So my question is, why would we discourage a company from including benefits that were previously unheard of? Again, assuming that there's not going to be any major trade-off, I'd love to have a vehicle that has HEPA filtration, which is kind of another example of how Tesla went out of their way to improve the product. Previously in the automotive industry, there was no expectation that any of the automakers needed to improve filtration, but Tesla includes HEPA filtration in their vehicles, which again, why wouldn't you want that? I think that's excellent. The next couple of innovations I'll touch on were covered a little bit more in depth by Jason in his video. It's the 48 volt low voltage system and the steer by wire, both of which are really, really innovative and I think exciting. I'm not an electrical engineer, so I'm not gonna spend a ton of time talking about the 48 volt system, but as far as I understand, it just seems like a no brainer improvement and something that automakers have sort of toyed with doing in the past, but of course, nobody really went out of their way and stuck their neck out to take the risk and make it happen. And now Tesla has done that. And once again, I think they're pushing the industry forward in that regard. It's gonna reduce the amount of copper needed, reduce the complexity of the wiring, and in addition to that, they're using Ethernet cable for data, which again, just seems like a no brainer. Why aren't we using that in vehicles for data communication? And the last innovation I wanna talk about is the steer by wire, especially for a truck. I think this is really going to be a game changer. So when Tesla first showed pictures of their yoke steering wheel, I remember thinking they've gotta be doing steer by wire. That's the only reason that they would include a yoke instead of a steering wheel. And when I found out that they hadn't, done steer by wire, it was really surprising and honestly disappointing. And I just think that, I don't know if maybe that was something that was planned and then they had to scrap it because it wasn't ready, but they wanted to leave the yoke because they'd already shown it. I'm not really sure, but I think that that was a mistake because it soured a lot of people on the steering yoke, which isn't a good system for a traditional steering rack where you have to go hand over hand. It really makes no sense. And so I, I think that was a mistake, but now that they actually have steer by wire, it makes a ton of sense. And that's because you no longer need to do a bunch of turns hand over hand in order to go lock to lock. Now the wheel will have a very limited range of motion, but the wheels are gonna respond differently based on the speed you're going, which means in parking lots, you don't have to be vigorously going hand over hand to make your maneuvers to pull in and out of spots around tight corners. Um, but then it's going to adjust because obviously a system that's that sensitive would be super dangerous at highway speeds, but because it's continuously variable because there's no mechanical linkage between that steering wheel and the actual steering rack, now you have a vehicle that's just much more easy to operate. I really think that for larger vehicles, especially this is going to be a game changer. I do understand that some people are gonna be uncomfortable at first with the idea that there's no physical connection between the steering wheel and the steering rack and worry about malfunctions or failures. And that's totally reasonable. Um, but I think a good point that has probably been made many times already at this point is that this has been in use in aircraft for decades, aircraft that are carrying hundreds of passengers. So I think if it's safe enough for an industry where you're literally flying in the air with hundreds of passengers and there's flights happening constantly all over the world, uh, at this point, I think that's understood what type of redundancies need to be built in in order to make that safe. And it does look like with the yoke they're using on the Cybertruck now, they have gone back to a traditional push the center of the wheel for the horn, which is another thing that I think was a huge miss on their original yoke, making the horn a small button, just a really bad idea. Uh, so I'm glad they went back to a traditional horn. Another thing that I want to throw in there is that I noticed that the Cybertruck has an under bed trunk, just like the Ridgeline, which as a Ridgeline owner, I can say it's just super cool. I love having my trunk in the bed. And it's one of those things that as a reviewer, you know, you're going to see, oh, cool. There's extra space. We've got a trunk. We got the trunk in the bed. But as an owner, I think these are the things that make a huge difference. I use my Ridgeline's trunk all the time. I have a bunch of stuff stored in there that I don't really want to be in view when you look in the vehicle but it's just a lot of stuff that I like to have with me all the time, but it's nice to just have it out of sight, out of mind, locked away until I need it. So that's a huge benefit, and I'm actually super excited that they put that in the Cybertruck. A final point that I wanna add about the Cybertruck that I think is cool is for such an exciting and innovative vehicle, it's really, really nice to see it coming from a manufacturer whose goal is to produce the vehicle at volume 
and sell it to as many people as possible, which sounds silly because you'd think that would be the goal of every auto manufacturer. But nowadays, I just think it's really frustrating how so many of the higher end vehicles are becoming this unobtainium where you have to, you know, own all these ones before and get on a wait list. And I just think that's ridiculous. Now, whether or not they'll be able to produce it in the numbers they want to remain to be seen, but the fact of the matter is that is their goal, and we can see that's been their goal and how they've produced their vehicles in the past, how they price their vehicles and reduce the price versus vehicles like the Porsche GT3 that are held in exclusivity for the sake of exclusivity. And I really think that that's a shame. I'm very excited to see more of the Cybertrucks out in the wild to see more of them get produced. And honestly, if I could afford one now, I would probably get one, but maybe it'll be a possibility in the future, who knows. If you got this far in the video, thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed. And if you did like it, go ahead and hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. Thanks.